This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it this day. And the word for today, the joyful word today, is the word repent. I want to invite you and me to repent. Now, for better or for worse, that is a word that has become largely misunderstood in our day. We associate it with um, doomsday prophets walking around with weird placards telling people repent, the end of the world is near. We often associate it with feelings. We think about to repent means feel bad about yourself, feel bad about what you have done. Now, of course, there is a time to feel bad about what it is that I have done, but that's not what repent means. You may know that the basic message of Jesus is summarized that now life in God's kingdom, in God's presence, God's care, God's love, God's guidance, God's favor, God's power is available as a real option for human beings. And Jesus says now in response to this, we are to trust that this news is true. We're to lean into it with our lives and then repent. Repent is not mostly a feeling word. It's mostly a thinking word. Metanoeo is the Greek word, meta is for after. Noeo is related to the word for mind, new. So it's like second thoughts. Think again, think again. Dallas Willard talked about it as uh, reconsider your strategy for living. Or we might think about your design for life. You know, design thinking in our day is a big deal. And so at places like Stanford, they will have the school of design. And then folks like Dave Evans or B.J. Fogg will talk about applying design thinking, systems, strategy, and so on to your life. That really is what it means to repent. And we're learning together about the power of habits, that to be a follower of Jesus means to be enthralled with God in our minds, to come to love him dearly and believe there is no limit, no catch to his goodness or God's power to carry out his goodness. But then the other part of the curriculum to become like Jesus, to follow Jesus, is to be transformed at the level of our habits because we are a mass of habits. And this is where repentance comes in. Repentance is redesign your life, the systems of your life, so that the habits, the thoughts, the intentions, the desires, the beliefs that are flowing inside of you, the inside of the tree, become changed and, and reflect God's goodness and God's presence with us so that uh, becoming a person of love and truth and courage and encouragement and generosity becomes second nature, habitual. Now, in Charles Duhigg's book, he talks about one person uh, who understood this very, very deeply. Uh, this is quite fascinating. He's a football coach named Tony Dungy. We may talk a little bit more about him as we go along. Among other things, Tony is a very devoted follower of Jesus. But Dungy waited 17 years to become a coach in the NFL. This is what Duhigg writes. He'd been interviewed four times. Those interviews had not gone well. He hadn't become a coach. Part of the problem was Dungy's coaching philosophy. In his job interviews, he would patiently explain his belief that the key to winning was, guess, changing players' habits. He wanted to get players to stop making so many decisions during a game, he said. He wanted them to react automatically, habitually. If he could instill the right habits, his team would win. Champions don't do extraordinary things, Dungey would explain. They do ordinary things, but they do them without thinking. Too fast for the other team to react. They follow the habits they have learned. The mark of a mature disciple is somebody who effortlessly does what Jesus would do in his place because it has gotten into us by the power of God's grace at the level of habit. The owners would ask Dungey, how are you going to create these new habits? Dungey would say, oh, no, no, no. I'm not going to create new habits. Players spend their lives building habits that get them to the NFL. Rather than creating new habits, I'm going to change their old ones. The secret to changing old habits was using what's already inside the player's head. And then Duhigg talks about that habit loop. We have cues, and then we have a response, and then there is a reward. Now, in many, many ways, the scriptures, starting with the Old Testament, um, are the most brilliant plan for habit formation or reformation in history. I mentioned the basic text of the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 6, was called the Shema. Notice this. Think for a minute about cue, response, reward. 
Moses says, Hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Now, the idea of that is they're not something that we just give rote, habitual obedience to in that sense, but something that change my mind and my way of thoughts and what it is that I desire. So that's the response that God wants, love, just love. How do, we, how do I move towards that? Well, then he gives some cues. These commandments are to be on your, um, on your hearts, impress them on your children. So when you see your kids, you'll think about them. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk, sitting and walking, going in, coming out. Write them down on your hands and your foreheads, door frames and gates. So the cue, you put the cue all over the place. And then Moses says, this is actually in verse 3, uh, hear and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may flourish in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord your God has promised. You will become a great people. God will do a great work in your midst. There is a great reward. There is a great life. Doesn't always mean that it will be prosperous or pain-free, but it will be life with God. It's right there from the beginning. Cue and then response and then reward. And then you see this all over the place and you can get very creative with this. So for example, when Moses is writing a little bit later on in Deuteronomy 22, he says to people, if you come across a bird's nest and you see a mother there with a young, you can take the young, if there's eggs, you can take the eggs, don't take the mother. When I see this, I will remember the wonder of motherhood and the wonder of creation. I'm seeing some quails fly above me right now and I will honor that. A few verses later, Paul says, this is in Deuteronomy 25, uh, when you're plowing with an ox, don't muzzle the ox that treads the grain. So the idea is now when you go to work, um, care about that ox and get in the habit. When you go out there, um, don't prevent the ox from eating the grain. And it may well be also that that was intended as a way of if I'm borrowing my neighbor's ox and I think to myself, ah, I don't want to eat my grain because that's my money, so I will work him really hard, but I won't feed him. No, 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 be generous. R remember that every time uh, you put that ox in the plow, in the yoke, then you're reminded to have compassion towards creatures. And, and Israel was brilliant. God was behind the brilliance of the way that you would dress and what you do when you eat. And when you see children or the aged or your parents or the alien or the widow, all of the time when you have feast days, when it's the Sabbath, when it is that sabbatical year, when it is the year of Jubilee, when the sun comes up and it's time to say the Shema, um, when you look at the tassels on your prayer shawl, cue uh, building habits that come from the inside. So the invitation for you today is repent. And what you could do right now is just do a, a quick habit audit. You may want to spend some more time with this. That's what I've done. And a lot of times uh, uh, in the morning when we first get up, there's just a whole bunch of habits. I wake up. What I'm doing now is to stand and say, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then wait a few seconds and smile. Um, I always go to the bathroom. I always have to take a little strip off my mouth. I wear this little thing to keep me from snoring, hopefully at night. And when I do that, I can remember that my mouth can bless God. And I brush my teeth and I shave my face. I weigh myself, I get on a scale. And each of those are moments when um, I can attach to it if I want to in any particular way. Just a very simple thing that can be for my physical well-being, my mental well-being, or to connect me with God. I go into my office. I always fix coffee. Um, I always light a candle. I leave my Bible on the desk so that it will just remind me this is a time when I want to meet together with God, not as a rote habit, but that this might be on my heart. Sometimes a place can be both a cue and a reward. Many years ago, Nance and I were living in a home where we had the bathroom remodeled, so it became our favorite room in the house. And those were very active parenting years. And we realized we wanted to have a regular time of day when we were just being with each other, just talking about what's happening in your life, what's on your heart. And so when we would both come home from work, we would go upstairs, close the door so that the kids could not come in and sit on the floor in that room that we loved and talk. And that place became a cue. 
where a behavior that was really good to deeply connect with each other is just so easy to miss. We just needed a cue. And then the reward was it was just fun and it was a few moments of peace. Now that, when it's offered to God and God is a part of it, becomes repentance. Another just real simple application of this, a friend of mine was telling me how when he would wake up in the morning, reaching for the phones, one of the first thing he did, and there was an app on there, and he was always curious. It, it created, a cue creates this craving. I want my curiosity satisfied. But uh, it would feed his mind junk that's just not real good, not what he wanted his mind to be filled with first thing in the day. So the simplest way to stop doing that wasn't by trying to use more willpower. It was simply to remove the cue, to get rid of the app. And then he would have to try to relocate it or find it. And just simply not having the app there meant that that old routine was gone. That's what repentance looks like. You don't have to beat yourself up. Generally, that's not a real helpful thing to do. It's not primarily a feeling. Redesign your strategy for life in light of this remarkable opportunity to live in God's kingdom. Love is habit forming. Hi, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New for Habits. Now, at the end of this series, we're going to sit down with John and bring him some of your questions and talk a little bit more about the topic. But we want to hear from you. We want to bring him your questions. We've heard from a couple of you, but I know there's more questions out there. So if you've got a question, you can put it in the comment box if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, or you can email it to us at becomenew.me at gmail.com, or you can text it to us at 855-888-0444. If you want to spread the word, you can subscribe on YouTube, share this video with a friend, or give us a review on a podcast wherever you're listening. See you next time.